And now on Sydney Weekend, cheers with Ben Maloof. Thanks to firstvintage.com.au. And Ben is here in the studio with me for another outstanding instalment of our weekly wine segment. Ben, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dan. Great to be here. It's been a busy week. An email this week from Eddie. He says he's heard clean skins are not rubbish wine. He says the bottles you buy for two ninety nine are actually more expensive wines. It's just that they had wine left over when they filled the bottles with the expensive labels and they had too much and filled clean skins to get rid of the excess. Is he right? I think Eddie is doing a bit of wishful thinking. Uh, look, it's a good question, Eddie, and I guess the best answer to that is yes and no. Look, sometimes it can be the case that there are uh, you know, a little bit of leftover wine, they put it in some clean skins, but... There are also a lot of other reasons why clean skins are produced. Uh, It might not be the best quality wine in the world and they can't sell it, so they put it in a clean skin. Or alternatively, they may be explicitly made as clean skins, as a cheaper style of product that are intended to be purchased at, you know, $2.99 a bottle. Think of it in the same way as if you go down to your local markets and you go down and you do a little bit of antique shopping. Now you might stumble across something that's incredibly valuable, but chances are it's a little bit dusty and it's probably not exactly what you were you, know, you were hoping to get out of it. It really is playing Russian roulette. And the final thing about clean skins is, and it's a problem that I have, Yeah. what happens when you find a product that you really, really love? Don't know where to get it again. And that's not fair to yourself as a consumer, and it's not fair to the winemaker who's made something that's really appealing to your tastes. So, look, Eddie, that is the case sometimes, but uh, I wouldn't uh, be banking on that being the case all the time. (laughs) Okay. Eddie asks a supplementary question. He says, does a glass have an impact on wine? Should we serve different wines in different glasses? Look, technically, yes, you should. Let me say, though, it's not an exact science. There's a lot of debate about this, but there's a really basic general principle. And last week, Dan, we spoke about decanting wine. Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah. Letting the oxygen get to it. Absolutely, absolutely. So following through from that thought, the wines that you would generally decant, you want to be able to put more air over the surface of that wine. And accordingly, your red wine glasses are generally larger, They have greater surface area. Now, go to the other end of the spectrum and think about a sparkling wine or a champagne. Mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they come in those really thin, narrow uh, glasses. Now, if you were to leave a sparkling wine out for half an hour or 45 minutes without consuming it, it'd go flat. Of course. It wouldn't be the way that the winemaker intended it to be. Okay, so you expose the greater surface area of the champagne, it goes flat. Exactly right. So with the red wines, what we want to be doing, we want to turbocharge that uh, that aging process again, get those beautiful aromas out of the wine with your sparklings. They're fresh, they're crisp, they're ready to drink right now. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, a supplementary. Again, should you rinse a glass after finishing one bottle and starting another? I think I know the answer to this. <laughs> well, Dan, look, you've got children, don't you? Yeah. If one of your kids had a big glass of milk and then said they wanted a glass of orange juice, would you tell them to put it in the same glass or a different glass. It'd be in a different glass. Absolutely. And it's a pretty basic, simple reason for that. You're contaminating flavours. Yeah. And what we've talked about every week on the show is making sure that we represent the wine in the way that the winemaker of course. intended you to drink it. And yeah. when you start you know, cross-pollinating those flavours, you don't do that, so you don't get an accurate picture. And uh, accordingly, you don't know exactly whether you like the product for what it is. Brilliant, brilliant. And Peter from Hornsby says, uh, should I store my wine in a temperature-controlled cellar? Yeah, look, that is a very good question. The temperature-controlled nature of wine or storing wine in a temperature-controlled environment is important. Uh, You don't want a volatile range of temperatures, but consistency is the number one thing. You used to have to store your wines uh, in that really specific temperature because of uh, cork. And because oh, yeah, yeah. cork, yeah, it used to expand and contract sure. with the heat. Nowadays, most of your wines are coming uh, in the screw caps or the Stelvins, as they're technically known. Means that you don't need to keep them in exactly the same temperature all the time because you don't get that volatility. But look, 
for me, I wouldn't be going out there as an everyday consumer spending $5,000 on a wine fridge in the bottom of the cupboard, in the bottom underneath the stairs. It'll be perfect. It'll be fine. It'll drink well. Brilliant report as always. You can find Ben at firstvintage.com.au. That's firstvintage.com.au. Benny, see you next week. Thanks, Dan. Looking forward to it.